All right. Well, hi, everybody. This is Don Williams uh, playing host today for Inside College Soccer. And uh, I've got three staff members with me today, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and, and, um, and, and, and give a brief introduction on what their experience is and, and how they are experts in the world of college soccer, because they each have a very unique perspective. And today we're going to talk about college ID camps. Uh, we're going to about third party camps. We're going to talk about uh, specific school camps. So I'm actually very excited for this episode with camp season coming up. Uh, and we get these kinds of questions all the time. Are these camps worth it? How do I navigate them? So uh, first up on the board is uh, my East Coast man, Steve Rollins. Hey, Steve, how are you doing today? Good, Don. How are you? So, so I'm out here on the East Coast. I happen to live in, in, in Princeton. So, you know, in the, in the world of the Ivies is, is literally right down the block from me. Um, most of my college, uh, most of my coaching experience has been on the, on the pro academy levels. Um, so I worked at two of those over in Europe. And for the last you know, 10 years or so, I've been running independent uh, training for high school age kids, getting them into, uh, into college soccer and getting them college ready. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Andre, Luciano, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well. So I am uh, based back home in Las Vegas. I uh, spent 25 years coaching Division I soccer with um, 18 seasons or actually 18 years at Northern Arizona University. And prior to that, I was at uh, Washington State, University of Arizona and Utah State. And uh, I am a Indiana University soccer alumni and uh, played at the Alba Pi College at the junior college level. So uh, now I'm back here in Vegas and helping kids uh, move forward with their college uh, decisions. National champion at Yavapai, right? Yep. That's black sheep, not black, many of us can black, say. Black, black sheep at Indiana University when they said that uh, you're the first class that never went to the final. So that, that's like a stinging uh, you know, portrayal of who you are as a player. Yeah, those were those were the years, the the, the Yegley senior years. That was brilliant. Yep. And then we got my man Joe Cleary. So we've got all areas of the country. We really have covered me in California, I'm, I'm in, Andre I'm in, in Arizona, in, you in Nebraska. No, Iowa, Nebraska. Nebraska. Yes. Paul. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Both. Um, yeah, my name is Joe Cleary. Uh, I was on the College Recruiting Myths podcast that we did um, a couple months ago. Um, I had 10 years of college coaching experience before transitioning to a different re uh, role in higher education, uh, which I do now. And uh, I coached at the Division One, Division Two, and Division Three levels. And I spent a lot of time at uh, during those times as a graduate assistant and a volunteer coach. So I I know the camp circuit real well. I've I've worked camps from Denver to Chicago, um, from Canada to Texas. So. Um, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in the camp world and uh, kind of what it entails. Yeah, this whole camp phenomenon, guys, is, uh, I, I say fairly new. It just tells you how long I've been in the game. But I do remember a day when camps at colleges were, hey, kids, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, come in from your local communities. We'll teach you a little something that maybe your clubs aren't teaching you. You'll have a great experience with our staff. And some of our players, you'll get to, we'll sign autographs and, you know, and uh, we'll leave you with a great camp experience. And that's what camps used to be. And then I remember, and I can't even tell you the year that happened. I was at Cal State East Bay and we decided to have a joint camp with Cal Berkeley. And I don't know, I think maybe Holy Names was in there. And I don't know, maybe Menlo. We, we invited it and we decided, oh, this would be a good idea. And we started using camps as an, as a, invite ID tool to, to bring in players that we wanted to see in a different environment. And, and that was the first time that I remember that. And gosh, that was probably eight, 20, gosh, probably 18 years ago now. Um, and in, since then, obviously clamps, camps have grown into a ID camps have grown into a multi, I don't know, probably billion dollar business. A lot, lot of money in camps, a lot of money. So Let's start, let's start with uh, third party camps. So 
Look, I'm not going to advertise for all these camps. There's huge national names, um, uh, exactly who they are. I don't want to nail, but uh, they are third party camps and they invite anywhere between five, 10, 20, sometimes 25 at the bigger national camps, college coaches. And some of them are uh, the Stanford's and Notre Dame's and the uh, Ivy Leagues uh, of the world. And, they, and they, they say, hey, we will have staff from all of these schools here to identify you. And then when we look at the staff, sometimes it's uh, turned out it was a senior who is graduating, who that school sent to represent. I've heard that story. Uh, sometimes it's the fourth volunteer assistant who needs to make some money. Sometimes it's uh, a smaller division three school that we've maybe never heard of the name of, head coach, and everything in between all of that to that come to these third party camps. Um, which one of you guys have worked these camps? Actually I actually worked these camps. Tell, tell, you want to start that one out, Joe, what, what these camps are, are about and how it works? Yeah, so I worked, uh, like I said, I won't say the names because I mean, they treated me well as an as a employee, quote unquote, of those camps. Um, but when I was a volunteer assistant at the University of Wyoming, I worked a couple third party camps um, along with school camps. And they obviously advertised that a member of the University of Wyoming coaching staff was going to be there, which was not not untruthful. But um, and I'm not sure exactly how the NCAA rules have changed. But at that time, the only way volunteer assistants could really do any recruiting was at camp. So I wasn't technically a recruiting coach. Um, I never went on the road for the University of Wyoming other than when I was working camps. Um, they asked my opinion about players through film or if we had players at our own camps, but I didn't recruit any players specifically. Um, so I would go to these camps and um, knowing that I was getting a paycheck that was going to help me pay rent that month. And uh, I, I put forth my best effort and foot, but I, I'd be honest, I wasn't really looking for players. And, and even if I was, the, the couple camps that I did work, uh, there was a lot of players, um, just a variety of levels. And it was always hard. It was sometimes hard to tell how good a player actually was because they would just be mixed in with players who maybe weren't up to the quality that we were, we were looking for at the University of Wyoming anyway. So it's just, it's such kind of a, I mean, for lack of a better term, the ones that I experienced were a little bit of a crapshoot as far as talent wise and what you could see. They're, they're organized and I don't think um, players left with a bad experience. I don't think coaches left with a bad experience. Um, so if you're looking for an experience, that's certainly it. Um, but as far as a recruiting thing, I don't, I don't know if that's the best first, that's definitely not my first choice as someone who is, would be suggesting camps. So that's my experience working them. Yeah. Um, and, and Andre, I, I want to hear what you, do, you know, I, I know you've probably sent assistance to these camps and you probably worked some of these camps. What's, what's your experience with the big national third party camps? I've never worked one. Just never why, have. Why, uh, why as a head coach, would you not have worked one? Well, number one, you know, time is the most critical thing that a head coach does not have, you know, and uh, I just didn't have enough time to uh, to do that. I felt like for an assistant coach, it was uh, it was a good way for them to develop their coaching skills, to run sessions and, uh, and to give them an opportunity to maybe interact in, you know, and, and get to know other coaches in the uh, industry as well which I thought was good. It was a good networking for them as well. Uh, but for me, I think the biggest thing was, you know, I just, you know, I come from the Indiana soccer camp, you know, system, which we had 2,400 camp, you know, kids in the summer, you know, 600, you know, 600 kids per week. Two, uh, wait a minute, 600 kids in a week, four weeks, 2,400 kids that are vying yeah. for what, yeah. eight, eight spots? But that's the thing, like none of those camps were made to, for an identification purpose. God. You know, that that to me was where my camp philosophy came is that camp was not about identification. Camp was about development. And if you were a good player and you were able to showcase yourself and you got pulled in through, you know, from if you're, you know, they'd have four divisions. If you're a division three player, a division four player, 
and you're a good player, you got pulled into Division Five, which was the highest pool of U16, U17 players. And you would have, you know, all four of those coaches would be Division One coaches working with you. And you'd play in the showcase, you play, you know, you'd, you'd showcase yourself on a daily basis. So I just never felt that a one day ID camp or a one and a half day ID camp and having 20, 30 minute sessions with kids was a really good way to identify a player. Uh, so I, I just think philosophically, my idea of camp was a little bit different than most people. Yeah, you know, you're going to get called old school for that, that you don't know what you're talking about, that that's yeah, not the way it's okay. done nowadays. Yeah, that, that, that's okay. I, I, I still like being a, an educator when it comes to the game. Yeah, I that that I, that's an interesting perspective. I don't know that I've talked to somebody exactly about that perspective. That was my that was my perspective too. And my perspective of those third party camps was that, uh, look, the quality of players, as Joe said, it, it isn't always exactly what we would like it to be. Uh, so it was difficult that even if a player was was oh that player's standing out. Then the next question in my mind was always, well, are they standing out because the quality of the other players aren't very good or are they standing out because they really are a college ready top level player? And so the answer for me was, well, go ahead and invite them to our camp, to our camp where I can create the exact environment that I want not the environment that my employer wants, as Joe said, you know, it's when you go to these camps, you have to do what your employer tells you to do in the way that you do it. And I know that the, that the, I'll call them younger coaches that are going and working these camps, uh, oftentimes are simply assigned a list of players that they need to evaluate anywhere between yes. 15 and 25, depending on how big the camp and, is, they just divide and, them up. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, and you're told, and this is this is for college camp. When I work big colleges camps too, and you're you want to evaluate, you want to be honest with with players, um, but you're also going to be nice because no one comes back to a camp after a bad evaluation. <laughs> um, and I mean, I've seen some evaluations from some, some camps with players ranked at 90s out of 100. I'm like, okay, if you're 90 in the 90s out of 100 for a player in in the United States system of recruiting then you're, you're one of the best players in your region um, in, in terms of my grading ability. Um, but that's just, that just me. And I think the other thing to remember is too, is like some of these coaches who are at these camps, I mean, I said it myself, I worked those camps as a volunteer assistant because I needed to. I didn't know that's the only way I could make money. Uh, the second I started, the second I became a full-time assistant coach, I, I still worked a couple of bigger schools camps, but I didn't... Uh, didn't really end up at, end up at too many third party camps or any third party camps after that. Steve, um, let's talk. There are some, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. There are some third party uh, Ivy League camps. They're the, uh, I forget what they call them, but they basically take all of the elite academic schools in the country, and there is camps designed around those too, isn't there? So, so, so there is, but again, it's it's not much different than what Andre and Joe has said on, on the bigger camps. Um, I mean, the problem with the Ivy League camps from, from a coach's standpoint is that most of the kids can't get into the school. So- Yeah, but Steve, my soccer will get me into the school is the argument that I hear a lot. I want my soccer to get me into a school that I can't get into otherwise. So- How much I, I, truth I, I, is there to that? So, so there's a- there's just a little bit of truth. So if the school GPA is a three, nine that they're looking for out of high school and you're a three, eight and a phenomenal soccer player, you might be able to get a favor done. If you're a three, two, no shot. Right. You could be, you could be messy. You're not, you're not getting into that school. <laughs> right. And, and so there's a little bit of truth, but it's, but it's not the way it's presented. So, so when we look at the, the elite camps here, you know, most of the coaches look at it as more like lightning in a bottle. They tend to be local to the Northeast. They're, they're not traveling far to go to them. Do they really think they're going to find a kid? No, they tend to pay very well. So a lot of the coaches like, like to go. And hey, if we get lucky, we get lucky. But that's not why they're there. Yeah, I mean, the pay is anywhere I've heard between 750 for the lower end schools, 
500 if it's really local to up to $2,000 for a camp, uh, sometimes a few dollars more than that. So we're talking about not insignificant money to coaches who may be making 30, 40, top $50,000 a year. If you're an assistant, for sure, top, top end. Uh, my last full-time gig was 22 grand plus benefits. So total package 30 something at, you know, at a fairly significant uh, level of a state division two school. So certainly not enough to feed a family on and camps were absolutely part of uh, how do I feed my family and, and take care of my, my, my kids. Don, I do want to jump in on, on something like that. We can, before we get into the college side of things that I would uh, want to bring up as far as third-party camps and the ones that I do do like at least in our area of the Midwest is camps that I do like are third-party camps that are maybe put on by clubs. Um, and oh, I started to see more and more of these pop and, up, Joe. Tell us what you're talking about. So, like, um, so for example, one of our clubs in Omaha, actually, all of our big, big clubs in Omaha will, um, during the winter, one in the winter, one in the summer, they'll host an ID camp and they invite college coaches who have relationship with the club already. Um, whether they've recruited kids from that uh, club, have kids on their team from that club, or are from the area. So, I, like, when I was at Wayne State, I would go to all the Omaha clubs camps because we recruited from those clubs um and i went i went with the purpose of it was a recruiting trip um and i think one those numbers tend to be smaller because so to make those and this is a, the, the important thing to remember you don't have to be a part of the club to be at those in those club camps clubs cannot close they can limit the number of people that can go to the camp there can be a cap on the roster but there cannot be a cap on who can attend that's unless they want to be in violation of ncaa rules so if you see a camp in your area that you're interested in going to that's put on by a club that you don't belong to, you can reach out to them and ask them how, they, how you can sign up and they have to quote you a price that is in the same line as what they would charge their members as well, because that has to be NCAA. Um, that's part of the NCAA requirement as well. And I mean, I've had players when I've been at a club, you know, let's say I went to Sporting Omaha's club, there were players from outside of Sporting Omaha there that I still got to look at and the numbers were smaller because there just isn't as many kids because typically it's going to be all one club's kids. So as far as third-party camps, I mean, if you're going to go to the ones, I think like the club, the club ones can sometimes be a little bit better of a bet depending on the area. Now I'm, I'm very speaking much, very much towards like more of the Midwest, but um, it may be different out um, East and West. So. Yeah. yeah and and well, that's the one thing that we, Oh, go ahead, Andre. Yeah, go ahead. And, and that's one of the things that kind of really bothered me about sometimes about the third party camps is that they would advertise that you're going to be there as a coach. And you would get emails saying, Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you for working with me at camp. <laughs> and, and, and as a coach, I'm like, I was never at the camp, you know? So I, I, I just, I just felt like there wasn't sometimes enough, uh, like a, like a genuine, uh interest on the kids part they're just like hey just happy to throw my name back out whatever schools they told me that they were going to be at this camp and, and i never get a chance to work with them because you just don't have enough time you know you're doing a one and a half day camp you got three sessions with them and you have a hundred kids there at the camp and you know i just never felt that a college coach could sit down and have a 30 minute evaluation on a player 40 minute in a small sided session and say hey this kid's going to be a great college kid so that, yeah. you know, that was, that was always my take was that there just wasn't enough time to evaluate a player properly. And at the end of the day, you'd have to, I think a lot of coaches would have to say, Hey, I liked you at our, at the camp, but come to our camp. So, you know, what's, what's the point of going to the third party <laughs> camp and just go bypass it and go straight to the college camp. And that's always my answer too, Andre is yeah, what's the, they're going to invite you to their camp. Anyway, you could have just gone there and saved the trip and save the eight, $900 total gas expense. I mean, camps aren't cheap unless it's local in your hometown where you can sleep in your own bed. We have a lot of kids taking and, you know, parents don't want their kids to travel alone. So mom or dad or mom and dad, sometimes mom and dad and siblings are going with a kid on a plane or a long car ride to a camp, uh, hotel expenses, out of town food expenses, 
camp expenses. I had literally had a player mm, about a year and a half ago where I asked, how many camps have you been to? And she told me, and I said, how much do you think you spent? And mom said, about $12,000 and had no oh. results for it. But the answer that I hear back from camps and why do you think this is guys? And I'll let each of you have a crack at this one. The most common response or one of the most common messages that I get from parents, I got another one this morning is my kid's been to a number of camps and has gotten some really good feedback from coaches. Why aren't we getting contacted? Because like you said, Joe, I saw one the other day and I, or maybe a few months ago and I, player posted online their evaluation from camps. It was all 98s, 97s, 95. And then no coach was reaching out to them to recruit them. And I thought, oh, come on. If a player's a 97, 98, 99, 95, we're all recruiting that player. Something's going on here. So what do you think's going on with this? Honestly, without, without trying to read too much into it, what's going on with you know, that comment? My kid's gotten a lot of really good feedback on them from camps. Uh, Andre, why don't you start? We'll go right down the line. Andre, Steve. So, so if I had a, if I was, if I had an institutional camp and I had kids that came to camp and we had evaluated kids before and we we're using the camp as a, as a last, uh, last evaluation on a player before, you know, August hit, we, uh, we typically, you know, the NCAA rules require that you have to leave camp at the end of camp and then leave campus and then come back onto campus to have a conversation. So we identify three to four kids and say, hey, you know, listen, we, uh, we really liked what you did at camp. You know, are you able to uh, meet up with us after camp? And I would say probably 60% of my roster when I was at Northern Arizona University were kids that came through camp at one point in time. So that was my final evaluation on a player is, you know, do I like their training habits? Do I like their personality? Would be, would they be a good fit for us? And it wasn't just solely about the soccer because I think the soccer was already predetermined on my part uh, for some of the kids. And then every once in a while, you'd have a kid that showed up out of nowhere that we've never seen before. And I'm like, Hey, you're special. You're crushing right now. And that's the one kid, you know, you, it's your, it's your one kid that you pick out a camp like that. That's just the, the diamond in the rough that no one has ever seen. And I think that's where the value in camps is, you know, is that you, you get a chance to maybe showcase yourself a little bit more in front of the coaches, but I think it really depends on how many days that the one ID camps, I, I, I think I did one of them in 18 years. I, I did not like to do the one day ID camps. I didn't, I felt like I was taking money from the kids if I did that. And so I, my, our specialty were three days, four day camps and where kids were able to get really, you know, valuable information from us, but they were also able to showcase themselves in a, in a much less condensed environment. So, so Andre, I have a question for you. In the current COVID environments where a lot of the universities are not allowing camps to do housing, would you still push the three-day camp knowing how much more expensive it is for the children i think it depends right that's uh, i think uh you know I, I struggle with the financial aspect of how expensive it is for camps now i really do and so you got to find the balance of like you know is it a two-day camp is it a, a a one day i just don't feel like a one-day camp First of all, kids are traveling. A lot of kids will try to, you know, circumvent the overnight stay by traveling the same day of the camp. So they get out of the car and they're physically, they just can't compete. And, you know, they're already stressed and they don't know anybody and everything is new. And so their first session and a half, they're, they're struggling with that. And so I think a minimum two days has to happen. And, you know, some kids are just nervous, you know, and, and some coaches are like, oh, I want to see that. I'm like, that's not fair. If the kids are paying you, you know, they, they are your customers. And so camps are, we're in a service industry. Once anybody's paying you, we're, we're in a service industry now, and it's our job to provide them the best learning environment. So I think two days, you know, in a hotel, sometimes it might even be cheaper two days in a hotel than having to charge 675 or $700 for, uh, you know, for a camp fee. 
Yeah, and I think, and like Andre brought up a good point, like you're in the, the, the service industry when you're offering camps and Don kind of tie it back to your point about the evaluations. Um, we would yeah. try and give, we would try and give everyone feedback, but like Andre even said it too, there were three or four kids that got different feedback than everybody else. Like I would tell, I could tell a kid as a coach, be like, yeah, your first touch was good. Um, I'd like you to work on your speed of play. Um, send us your schedule would be maybe a, a feedback I would give. Oh, like, and that's all oh, that's really good feedback. Um, with some criticism, but if there's a person I'm recruiting, it's, hey, um, I really like these things you did. I think you'd be a great fit in our team. Um, here are the things I want you to work on. I'm gonna call you next week, or why don't you meet up with us later and we'll have a conversation type of, like, there's two different types of good feedback. There's feedback, hey, let's keep work, you know, and then there's yeah. what, what you want to hear and what you need to hear are two different things. Sometimes yeah, camp. yep. <laughs> well, and what we used to do <laughs> is we, so we, we saw that kid at camp and we loved that kid. We would go to their parents, say, go, go get, you know, camp's over, go grab lunch, whatever, da, 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 da. But it had almost already been prearranged for most of those kids that they were going to come back to campus later they were going to spend the night with our girls we we're going to stick them into a dorm next day we we're taking the san francisco on a trip and kind of wine and dine them and woo them and turn it into an official visit like you said within all of the rules andre that the ncaa requires but how we approached kids that we absolutely wanted to be part of our squad was far different than how we approached kids that we want to make you feel good and we don't want to hurt your feelings and uh, we'd love to have you come back for our next camp, by the way. Uh, and also, go ahead, go Andre. No, well, go ahead. To, to Steve's point, like sometimes like we would have kids that are already committed come to camp. Yep. Oh, hundred percent. That's, you know, we, we used to call it, it seeding. It, it was, it was, seeding our kids. It, it was, it was their way of getting, interacting with the players that were working yep. camp and they'd stay in the dorms and they'd, you know, they'd figure it out and they'd get to know everybody. And then we would evaluate you know, the incoming kids that were already committed with the kids that were at camp and were like, hey, this kid is better than the kids that we already have committed. That's the kid that's standing out, you know, at, at, at the highest level. And so that that's where I think there's, you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, grade that goes on, not in terms of NCAA rules, but in terms of, you know, who are the kids that are really at camp? There's kids that are already committed. There's kids that have already been seen a ton of different times. Those kids are comfortable. They've had conversations with coaches. And then you have the kids that are just there trying to uh, showcase themselves, you know, like, hey, this is my my one chance to, to get evaluated. Um, and then I think the other thing that's great about the overnight camp, Steve, is that if you can't stay in the dorms, I mean, I, it's important, right? It's important that if you can see the facilities that you're staying, the meals that you're going to be eating, what's walking around campus feel like, does it feel safe? Does it feel crazy? Like in Flagstaff, it was pitch black because we're a dark sky city, you know, in the mountains. And the kids were like, this is, this is wonderful. I'm like walking around and I see stars and I've never seen stars because I'm from the city, you know? So like those things add value to, to that camp experience. But I've also been, you know, I've also been to camp where I stayed in the dorms. I'm like, I never want to stay here ever again. <laughs> right. And so, so maybe some camps, so maybe, some, so maybe some schools, they don't do the multi-day, you know, on residence camps because maybe the campus facilities aren't perfect and the coaches know that. Yeah, there's a, there's a certain, there's a certain high profile East Coast schools that's having protests on campus about black mold in the dorms and nobody's cleaning it up. And yeah, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to show those, showcase those to people. Steve, is it any different than what our coaches here are describing on the East Coast with the Ivy Leagues, with the Little Ivies, or is it, is it a different experience than what you're hearing described? So, so I think one of the things that's slightly different is when you're looking at like the really top end academic schools. So if, if you look at like a lot of the, the Ivy schools, the other coaches that come to those camps are ones that are a, maybe a step below academically and a step below soccer wise. 
because because they're looking at the kids who aren't quite you know crimson material right they're not going to get in there and they're not quite division one players but they have trouble attracting them to their smaller d3 school so that so that's one of the things that is fairly common out here is you get like your big ivy league school and then you get your baby ivies or your you know centennial schools next next gag schools and stuff right. will also be there recruiting because they know that they're looking for the kid that's not quite at the level of the headliner of the camp yeah and i and i think there's a fair similar so now we're talking let's get into just the the, the specific school camp school so there are schools where uh a school will have a camp and it's only their staff and attendance possibly some of their players are working the camp also there's those but then there's the ones that you described and we see them out west and we see them at different parts of the country and i think joe and andre have kind of described also a little bit what those look like but you know uh i know the notre dame camp is 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 a big one for they'll have, you know, Notre Dame being the premier name. And then, you know, Valparaiso would have been there back in the day. And, you know, you'd have also Holy Cross, who's just down the road would be there, which is a different level because they know full well that, you know, even if we see a Notre Dame kid here, we'd like to help out our other friends. And one of the ways to do it is by having them work our camps. So I think that's that's fairly similar in the rest of the country too. Is that your experience, Joe and Andre? Yeah. Joe? So like, yeah. so like, uh, I, I know coaches that have worked the same camp, college camps for twenty five plus years because it's the yeah. best place for them to recruit. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was, by far. I re- yeah, I recruited like what at the when I was at. The, after I left the University of Wyoming, I went back to their camp every single year because for two reasons. One, I, I was comfortable with it. I was friends with their coaching staff. I knew what type of players were going to be there. Um, I knew it. And then they were very, that those coaches were very honest with me. Hey, we're looking at this kid, this kid, this kid. Uh, here's, there's some kids here that they maybe were familiar with because it's their area. And I was, you know, either in Nebraska or North Dakota. Um, and even the same thing when I would go, I worked Regis University camps even after I didn't even live in the area because I, uh, coach McCall and coach Belzer, like were always very good to me in terms of how they treated me as a coach there, but also, you know, like, Hey, we're looking at this kid, this kid, um, you know, and so it was, it was very helpful. And like Andre said, I, we did re- those were some of my favorite places to recruit was other colleges camps. I just did. I always did very well at them. We got good players from other, other schools camps. Yeah, so I, I think we're kind of getting an idea now of 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 how that piece of it works. Andre, did you or Steve anything else to add to that, or Andre? No, for, I, I mean I think that is, you know, a real common practice out here on the East Coast, where you get the schools that are you know just not at the same level with the headliner and they're making those relationships with the coaches and they know, you know, Hey, there's five kids or four kids that, you know, the headliners looking at, and I'm looking at that next tier. And and I think if you're the camp director of that, uh, you know, from that specific university, you have a responsibility to provide as many options as possible. If you're running a larger camp, to address the whole spectrum of your customers, which are your campers, right? And so you have to provide a little bit of everything. So every camp that I ever ran, I had division one coaches, division two, division three, NAIA, junior college coaches, a full spectrum across. Some people are very good about it and some people are not. Uh, One of the questions I would ask that I think every camper has a right to is how many campers, what's your cap at camp? And if a coach tells you 80 players and you're like, well, who's, you know, how, what's your staff like situation? And they say, well, it's only our, it's only our staff. So then you do the math and you're like, well, you know, you're averaging about 25, 27 kids per training group with a kid. How well am I going to get evaluated? 
Whereas, you know, I would say with ours was always a 15 to one ratio was always what we wanted. 120 kids, eight coaches, 15 to one ratio. That's, you know, that's where, that's where we, you know, that's where we want to be so that your time evaluating a player, you actually spend time with it. And then be honest with the one day ID camps. The reason I stopped doing it is that we would have, you know, 70 kids show up and we'd have two and a half staff members running around all over the place, trying to get the camp sorted out. And we never really got a chance to evaluate the kids properly. And I think that as a camper, you got to ask, what's your, uh, what are the numbers cap? What's your staff to player ratio? And what are the coaches that are going to be working camp? Is it solely your staff or are you inviting other staff members as well? If you are a, you know, high gambling person and you want to just get evaluated only by one school, that's for your choice. But I think if you want to expand your uh, and broaden your recruiting base at going to camp, I think the, the camps where there's a multitude of different people there probably is the best bang for your buck. All right. I, here's the here's how I want to wrap this up, guys. Camp etiquette, camp etiquette, do's and don'ts. Um, my number one, look, when I coached high school, when I coached youth, players would come up and shake my hand when they arrived at training and they would shake my hand when they left training. Uh, college, it was a little more loosey-goosey because we were around each other so much that I didn't care in college. They did, they're adults. Uh, but I was concerned with the youth that, that, that we were training them for how they should behave out in the world with the next generation. So there's, there's the opening salvo. Uh, go up and shake the coach's hand, introduce yourself. I'm so-and-so, here's where I'm from, you know, play, looking forward to working with you. And then do it after a session, thank them for their time. And then, you know, it gives, it does stand out when you see the kids just filtering and doing sessions and then filtering out that kid, I am going, oh, I kind of like this kid. I'm going to watch this kid a little more closely, see if they are any good. It does help you stand out. So that's, there's the op my opening salvo of advice. Uh, I'd like to go around the, go around the horn here and, and uh, hear what you guys think about do camp etiquette do's and don'ts. I think I'll, I could start off in that vein of introducing yourself to the coach and, and getting in with the coaches. I think if um, the program, if you're at a college camp, um, if the program has their players there, um, or you know that there's players there that are committed already, like talk to them, like, hang around them. Um, I mean, like, right. So like if I'm, if I'm at a college camp that has 50 people at it and I know for a fact that, these player, these five players over here, like you hear before that they're like, yeah, I'm committed already. Get into their group. Because what group do you think the college coach is going to be watching? Um, but also you want to know what they're about. I mean, if you go to a camp and you hang around the players and the committed kids and you're like, no, these, these are not my people. We always talk about right fit at SRUSA. That's part of the right fit. What type of kids are in their program? If they're not, and that doesn't mean they're bad kids. It just means maybe that they have a program filled of, with very loud players and you're not that. Um, but yeah, I think just being around the current members of the team and committed kids at the camp, that's not necessarily an etiquette thing. That's just like a huge piece of advice thing that I just, if you can do that, do it. What do you think, Steve? So, so I had this feedback in Don, you know, this is we had this conversation of, of a coach who did at a college camp and there's a fine line between wanting to showcase yourself and coming <laughs> off as a selfish ass. And a lot of kids will be on the wrong side of that line. Yes. And, you know, you, you have to present yourself as a good teammate on and off the field even while you're trying to showcase yourself and you know that that's one thing i would just say that you, you really need to be aware that there's a fine line there and once you're on the wrong side of that line it's tough to get back i've even heard stories about kids from the same clubs going to camps and like Kahoot, we're in cahoots. We'll all find each other. We'll make each other yeah. look good and then ignoring everybody else. I've heard those stories before. The other thing that I uh, I would caution players is is be aware that 
college coaches are looking at everything. And I think that sometimes social media, we make too big of a deal about like the little things like your presence on social media or like whatever, or your behavior or something. Those might not be the deciding factors, but they're definitely tiebreakers. So if I'm at a camp and I'm deciding between player A and player B, and then while we're doing camp or coaching, player B is talking while a coach is talking and player A is listening intently and it's, and it's neck and neck. And I have to make it. And it's a first impression. I'm making a snap decision that like Steve said, sometimes you can never come back from that. And that's just it. And I'm not saying that that's the, that's the end all be all judgment because it never is that, but if it's a tiebreaker and it comes down to the little things, you want to do the little things, right. Whether that's paying attention, getting in place, make sure you're listening, you know, being respectful. And then yeah, I just think that all the all the basic common sense, but understand that those are tiebreakers. Those are things that can that can separate you from the person next to you. And Andre, was it you that said the other day you tweeted something about like don't wear a USC shirt to a UCLA camp, that kind no, of thing? That no, 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 wasn't me. Blake did. Blake, Blake, oh Blake tweeted something about that. I've I've had players at Wayne State, I had players show up in and I, I, I love the coaching staff up, the, up there, but they're our travel partner. They would they went to Augustana up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and they're our travel partner and our, you know, one of our conference rivals. They went to their camp the day before and came down. I was like, why are you wearing an Augustana Viking shirt for my camp? <laughs> like, what are you doing? So, I, I, so- I, ne- I never cared about that. That didn't bother me. But this is what I would say for me. Uh, the biggest thing was have a level of professionalism when you come to camp. I think that's really important. And professionalism meaning that if you're going to go to a camp, show up fit, show up ready to play. Don't use camp as a, oh, I haven't done anything for a month and a half, two months, and now I'm showing up to camp. And you have to show up ready to go like it's a tryout. And, you know, like with anything, you know, I used to watch just kids what they do before warm up, you know, the kids that were out getting touches before on their own, the kids that were showing up early, th- those kind of things always stood out to me because those are the things that uh, that's who they were as a person. And that's what I would want, you know, in my program. So the kids that were ready to go, the kids that were never late, the kids that were early, you know, the early on time, on time is late kind of thing. The kid that was visibly, you could tell like, Hey, this kid's fit and they've been, this kid can go, they're, they're a motor, they're a machine, they can go at any point in time. And, you know, I had a conversation with a, with a kid that went to camp and wasn't super fit. And that was the number one thing that said the kid's not fit enough to sustain the level of training that we put her under in camp. And she recognized that. And so if you're going to go to camp, go to camp with the purpose of, you know, showcasing yourself at your best, not at your worst. I think that's really good advice. And look, and, and people are, might say, oh, you're just trying to be a suck up or whatever. But I appreciated the kid who stayed afterwards and helped pick up the cones and the balls. And the, I want to go it's home like would, everybody it's else. Would, and I, it's what, I we would expect good, from, yeah. it's what we would expect from players in our program. I mean, yeah. trust yeah. me, the, 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 I had favorite players in my program because of the little things that they did. And trust me, coaches, re- coaches see the player that always walks off the training field and never helps out. Like, don't be that camper. If you don't want to be, don't be that college player, but don't be that camper. And like, that's, well, that's it. And then who's the other one? Don't. Go ahead, Joe, yeah. finish. I'm sorry. No, Andre, 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 jump in. Yeah. No, um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Don't be, don't be the, the, the kid that you would want on, on your team, you know, like who's your, you don't be the teammate that you're, that always causes problems, you know? And I would also tell, like, especially, look, when I was growing up as a young coach, my specialty was goalkeepers, and I was doing lots of goalkeeper camps, and they were going to going to our goalkeeper trainings, and they were going to different camps, and I would say, don't be afraid to be the first one in the goal. Don't wait for everybody else and go stand at the back of the line because you're afraid. You It's like, no, jump in. Coach, run over. Be the first one in. Show them that you are a go-getter, that you want to be part of of this and i think the same thing goes for every player don't wait for everybody else to to take the reins and take control of the situation don't be afraid to jump in there and be a go-getter yeah i think Um, it's a good line too and steve talked about it in a different capacity but like 
um, if you play the six, tell the coach you play the six, but then say, but I've also been able to play this position. Like let the coach know where your best position is, but don't say I only play this position because that's just not, a, I mean, very rarely, unless you're a goalkeeper or you're a person who scores every single goal, every time you're on the pitch, you're not going to play one position you know, the entire time in college. Um, and then uh, the other thing too is communicate with the coach before camp. If something's going on, nothing is like, I would have, we would have a player at camp for two or three days and they wouldn't be very good. And then I would get a, at the end of camp or I get an email a week later from a parent or the kid being like, Oh, I, you know, I had a pulled hamstring or I, I didn't, I wasn't feeling good. And it's like, you didn't say anything when you're at camp. I mean, like communication is key and letting the coach know where you're at with things is important too. Yeah, no, I, I've actually had kids who came to the camp say, look, I came to the camp anyways. I want to check it out. I pulled my hamstring. I'm not going to be able to train, but I'm going to stay here at camp. I want yeah. to see what you're I'd much, I would much prefer, like, I would much oh, prefer Oh, I love that. you. I yeah. love you already. You're honest with me. You're up front. You're not making excuses. I, I like you already. And then I'll figure out another way to come see that kid play uh, if a kid approaches me that way. I think it's a really good point. Okay, so how I want to wrap this up, guys, is uh, – at, is the age thing because I get parents contacting me. My kids in sixth grade, should they go to an ID camp? Should they go to seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade? In each of your opinions, what's the magic number for actual identification? Look, I tell people all the time, sixth grader want to go to a, you want to go to the Princeton camp because you want to see the Princeton campus. You want to experience the Princeton coaches. You want to learn from the Princeton coaches. You want to do that at sixth, seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade. There's no problem with that. I, but to actually be identified when are coaches actually looking for players at their camps, dead serious. What ages do that start? Steve, we'll start with you. So I, I have two answers, one for the girls and one for the boys. So for the girls, it's spring of sophomore year to fall of junior year. That's That's really where you know, folks are, are getting hot. And I'm talking also like not your top two or 3% that are on the national team, you know, not your bottom, but for the 80, 90% of the kids that are going to get recruited in college, that's, that's the sweet spot. For the boys, it, it's a little later, you know, so I don't see out here much of the boys happening, again, outside of your really, really top echelon till fall to spring of your junior year uh andre i i would agree i think the uh maturation aspect the physical maturation uh there's a big factor in that i think going sophomore year to get initially evaluated huge junior year to uh to get a full commitment of a coaching staff to say hey that's a kid that we want so I think sophomore year, being able to do the initial evaluation in terms of, hey, here's a kid that we identified and we like, and then junior year to say, hey, this is a kid that we definitely want here. Yeah. And then- And, and do you the, agree with the boys and the girls side different that Steve was yeah, talking and, about? And, yeah, I think I think the, the really special kids, the really unique kids, you know, I think that a lot of the college coaches now are kind of having to hold off anyways because they're taking the pro path. And so even if you identify a kid at 15, 16, that's really special. You don't know where they're going to head, you know, like if they're going to just take off with one of the academies and they're not going the college route. So I would say late junior year for that one. Yeah. Joe, anything to add to that? Any, any different viewpoint from the levels you've coached at and where you've coached at? Yeah. I just think, um, making sure you know where the coaches are at. It, that's a key thing too. Um, Cause if you're a little bit of an older player and you're like, I'm going to come to camp, uh, it might be too late. Um, or if there's a coaching change, it might be perfect timing. Um, so I think like there are some obviously like wrinkles, but I, Steve, I think Steve <laughs> is pretty much already right, but there are, there's just some, there's some wrinkles that can, add into the to making it maybe that going to a camp later is okay um one of my clients they she just got seen a little bit later 
<laughs> and so now like a school wants her to come to a camp this uh this spring and she's a junior um but it's exciting but like that's also been communicated of why right there's always those wrinkles but yeah i think that traditionally there that wheelhouse is where you want to go unless you're looking for just experience or extra training or something and again we're generalizing right we're trying to cover like steve you put it very well we're talking about the 80 to 90 percent of most of the kids will play in college not necessarily the top, 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 and not necessarily the kid who's not very good and they're going to play to that not good at all junior college team where most of the girls have not played soccer in years, but the coach is just starting to fill a roster. They've got those two extremes. And then we're talking about most kids in the middle. And then the last piece of advice that I want to make sure that we, that, that I say is that especially positions like goalkeepers, look, Make sure that they're actually looking for a goalkeeper before you show up for the camp, because that can be a position that does get saturated with three, four, five goalkeepers already. And unless you are clearly heads and above, far and away better than any goalkeeper that they've ever seen at their institution, you probably don't stand a chance. It's going to be very difficult. And it can be that way in certain positions. Outside backs can get like that, can get a little saturated sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes midfielders can get a little saturated, especially if they're not spectacular midfielders. And it seems like every kid says they're a midfielder yeah, today. It's just so, so many of them. So, so Don, like, you know, just real quick, some of my best outside backs were forwards that came to camp. Yeah. Because conversion. I was able to, yes, because, I, because, I was able, because I was able to put them in different positions and different situations without, you know, uh, intruding on their clubs and saying, hey, why don't you play in the back this weekend let, or today, you know, let's have you play here, just based Very on good gut. point. And, and that kid was a, was a star, was a four-year all-conference player, a lot of those kids, you know, and, and the joke that I have, I always have, and it's not a joke, you know, two of my outside backs at IU were forwards, all-American forwards out of high school, you know, it, it just, it just happened that way. And then the other thing is, if a kid score goals, whether it be in camp, whether it be in a uh, in, in club, whether it be in high school, if they're scoring goals consistently every time that you see them, they're a goal scorer, and you know that. And so that's what kind of stands out. But my last point, Don, really quick, then I'll shut up, is uh, go to camp. Have, and I almost and I almost tweeted this today, so I'm glad that we I, I didn't do it. Uh, if you go to camp with the expectation of getting identified, there's a probably a 95 percent chance you're going to get disappointed. If you go to the camp with the expectation of learning and gaining something out of it from a tactical, technical, and some information standpoint and get some value that way, 95% of the time, you're going to have a great experience. And that 5%, that surprise that I got identified based on my performance, that's an added bonus on top of it. So I think if you're solely paying the money to get identified, there's a 95% chance you're going to get disappointed in the identification aspect of it. But if you go in there with the idea of, I want to educate myself about the school, about the coaches. Can I play for those coaches? Uh, can I, uh, you know, have I gained anything from their teaching that happened at camp? Then you have won. You've, you've, it's a well worth investment. Great point. Great it's well point. Worth investment. I think that's a good, good one to wrap up on right there, guys. That's, that's about yep. as good as it gets. I, I completely agree with that advice. Um, all right, everybody. Well, Thanks, guys, for joining me. Um, guys, in our show notes, everybody that's listening to this, we'll put uh, the Twitter handles uh, of, of all this stuff. All this staff here is almost on a daily basis tweeting something to help in the world of college soccer and getting there and youth soccer. And Steve, you've been on fire lately with your uh, coaching advice. So even coaching advice is coming, coming through it. And I appreciate all you guys. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay.